Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Again, welcome. My name is Dr. Jan Riolini. I'm the chair of the Texas Women's Healthcare Coalition, and I also serve as president of Healthy Futures of Texas, which is the nonprofit organization in San Antonio that um, it serves as the fiscal agent and leader for the Texas Women's Healthcare Coalition. And we're delighted to have such a wonderful turnout today. Um, I have uh, lots of things uh, that I could say, and I want to make sure that we talk uh, in about things that are helpful to y'all. Um, let me ask, how many here are staff of legislators? Okay. Good. How many here are staff and something related to the legislative session? Okay, so we have some additional. And how many are uh, members of the Texas Women's Healthcare Coalition from those organizations? Good, so we have a good turnout there. And who did I miss in that process? Who else is here? Okay, good. How many folks have been, uh, have staffed legislative sessions before? Okay, for how many people is this your first time around? Okay, so I'll try to kind of balance uh, some things that maybe some of you have heard before so the folks who are new to the issues can help uh, follow along. And um, please, please, this is intended to be interactive uh, so I could be heard. I'm standing behind this uh, podium, but I really want to reach out to you to ask questions or make comments as we go. Um, and if there's things that you want to know more about or less about as we go <laughs> along, please let me know. Um, first, let me take the opportunity to say thank you to Representative Donna Howard and her Chief of Staff, Scott Daigle, who I think uh, is still here. Thank you. Thank you so much for helping us arrange to be able to uh, use this room and to be able to talk with you today uh, so close to your offices. We, we can't tell you how much we appreciate you. Thank you so much. And I want to say thank you to all of our coalition members who are in the room. Thank you for your support. And know that um, although I happen to be the individual talking, it's the coalition members that make this work, that really give it the, um, the power to um, help people understand what is needed for women in Texas. So thank you so much. Thank you to all of you uh, who are here. Okay, well, next slide, please. Um, there we go. So the Texas Women's Healthcare Coalition, what is that? It's a group of organizations. We now number 46, but we're increasing all the time. Some of us are physician organizations, nurses or nurse practitioner organizations, uh, healthcare organizations, providers. Um, we have many um, advocacy organizations and we have faith organizations who are involved with us as well. And we're all focused on prevention. Please, next slide. This coalition was formed in 2012 uh, as a response to the big cuts, the severe cuts that happened to the family planning program, uh, the DSHS, Department of State Health Services Family Planning Program that occurred in 2011. And uh, we are gaining members and uh, gaining uh, understanding from many in the legislature on both in the House and in the Senate uh, and uh, the, uh, in the agencies about the importance of preventive care, um, how it is really different from abortion and how we need to support that for healthy women, healthy babies, and healthy families in our state. It also helps us save money. So um, the first, um, on this figure, you see what we tried to do at the end of the last session in 2013 was give sort of a visual picture of what happened over time with funding for that preventive care for women. And if you see the pipe is about this big in 2010, before the cuts, was cut basically two thirds 
in that session in 2011. And then in 2013, when you patch together all the different programs, including one that's outside of the state government, you see that we're uh, funding wise, theoretically, we should be able to reach as many women as we could before those cuts happened. There were many people who were very important to that process of um, encouraging support for the, the restoration of funding, getting that funding for uh, expanded primary health care, for family planning, many, many people. I think the, the coalition was helpful also. But there were some uh, folks, uh, Senator Jane Nelson in particular um, in the Senate was extremely uh, important. Uh, here on the House side, uh, we're very grateful for Representative Sarah Davis and Representative Howard, Representative Dukes, and uh, Representative Zerwas for all the help. And of course, there are many others, representatives and senators alike, who were involved and we're very grateful for their um, efforts. So, uh, no problem, right? We can all go home now, the funding is there. Um, and that was sort of a surprise to me. I thought this would be a shorter term project. We, you know, fix it and then we can all go home and relax. But it turns out there's still a lot of work to do. And on the next slide, you see, I tried to put together a slide that shows you what the need is in Texas for the services that we're talking about, the prevention services uh, for women and what the supply is uh, estimated to be from the different uh, funding streams that we have. So uh, if, and we're not even considering the 18 and 19 year olds here, we're just considering the 20 to 44 because the Guttmacher Institute divides it up that way. Not sure why, but these are adult women. Over 1.3 million adult women are in need of the services, not just the services, but also in need of public support for the services. So there's a much higher number of women who need the services and these are the ones who need the publicly subsidized services 1.3 million and above and that estimate is for 2012 uh, a couple of years ago uh, the estimates for uh, what we have now uh, about 129,000 um, women were seen through the title 10 network with the women's he health and family planning association of texas over the last year so that's the best number we have for that. And then if you add up all the estimates of, uh, from the recent letter from the um, uh, HHSC, uh, the numbers that they estimate for 2014, you get about 267,000 uh, family planning patients um, that would be seen through the uh, DSHS, Texas Women's Health Program, um, and the DSHS is both family planning and EPHC. Next. We'll explain all those terms shortly. So let's back up and what kind, what kind of stuff are we talking about here? What is this stuff? The services are um, basically the prevention stuff that helps women stay well and prepare for a healthy pregnancy, time a pregnancy if they want one, and avoid a pregnancy if they want one, if they don't want one. It's not an abortion. Matter of fact, by statute, that is, uh, n has never been the case that any of these funds uh, were used for abortion, and abortion is um, certainly excluded. So our group doesn't focus on that. We're not looking at um, that issue. We're not looking at the issue of any particular provider. What we're looking at is getting the services that women need to help them stay healthy to have healthy babies and to reduce the cost to the state. So here's what the services are. It's much more than family planning. It's screenings for breast and cervical cancer. At some ages that includes a uh, breast exam and pap smear, um, high blood pressure screening, diabetes, cholesterol, obesity, mental health issues like depression, one of the most common abuse and violence issues, which are also very common, especially um, in low-income women, but among women of all stripes, uh, and screening for sexually transmitted infections. Matter of fact, one of the ways that the uh, government grades physicians uh, as to how well we're doing is whether we get a yearly test for chlamydia on women under, uh, that are 25 and under. 
So that's an important measure of quality that is recommended for all young women who are sexually active to have. In addition, it includes contraceptive counseling and helping them understand uh, what is available, what their options are, uh, if they're planning a pregnancy, how to address some of those issues so that they will be healthy, be taking their folic acid, and be as healthy as possible uh, for the pregnancy. It also covers the different methods, the supplies, the actual medications or devices, um, and it covers follow-up. In the expanded primary care program that is the new program that was instituted last year, uh, there are some additional services as well. Prenatal services, both medical and dental. Um, use of case management through community health workers is encouraged. And um, diagnosis and treatment of a number of different con conditions as well as mammograms for, usually those are for older women, older than uh, 40. Questions about the services? Is anything missing there? Anything you think shouldn't be there? Yes. Uh, you guys don't do delivery, so the post-delivery long, long active contraceptive devices, that's not included in the services, is that right? Uh, so the question is whether we do uh, deliveries and whether postpartum contraception is part of, our, um, of what we look at. And the answer to that is some of our members do deliveries and others don't. Some are providers and some are not. The coalition as, a, as an entity doesn't do any medical care. But the postpartum issues are part of what we look at in our uh, state legislative agenda. In particular, um, uh, we are looking at the sunset recommendation for uh, an automatic enrollment after a Medicaid delivery or an emergency Medicaid delivery to delivery uh, so that that woman can have a seamless entry into a uh, continuation of her access to birth control. Um, and then some of our members are also working on the issue of uh, uh, getting Medicaid to pay for the devices in the hospital as a separate uh, code. So that's going on as well with some of our members. Uh, the coalition as a whole is not addressing that, but some of our members are. Other questions? Yes. As what a screening is, and then if someone has a positive screening, where do you refer them? So the question is, what is a screening on some of these things, and what do you do if you have a positive screen? Great question. Um, the uh, screenings are, are recommended at different ages for different populations for a number of these things. For example, a pap smear is not recommended until a woman is at least 21 years old. And then uh, how often is less often than, e than yearly now uh, uh, is, is recommended. So if you take that, uh, uh, and blood pressure screening is recommended for basically every adult when you see them in the, in the office uh, at least once a year. Uh, diabetes screening and cholesterol screening is a little bit more specific uh, for populations more at risk. Uh, and women are less at risk than men, so it, instituting cholesterol screening would take a, you know, be with older women rather than with younger. Um, so what do you do if you have a positive? Someone turns up to have diabetes or high blood pressure or an abnormal pap smear, dysplasia, or something that really looks like it might be even uh, cancer. What do you do with that? Um, well. It depends on the system in which they're seen. The payment for that diagnosis and treatment may be available from special programs like the Breast and Cervical Cancer Program, uh, Cancer Control Program in Texas. Um, for some women and some problems, you may need to be referring them if they don't have insurance to county uh, hospitals and clinics, federally qualified health centers, and that sort of thing. Uh, for those of us who have worked at um, health department clinics uh, where most people are uninsured, that's something that we're used to doing. For people in private practice, it's a little bit more um, uh, hair-raising because people in private practice 
uh, may feel like they as a practice need to take care of that. So that's one of the things that's made it hard for some physicians to participate in the Texas Women's Health Program. Did that answer your question? So, and then the other thing to, to say is that for a lot of women, this is the care that they get. This is their entry into the, um, into the health system. So whether they're seeing uh, somebody at a federally qualified health center, uh, what I call a little podunk family planning clinic out there in the, on the plains, uh, whether it's a federally qualified health center, their family doctor, their OB-GYN or whoever is uh, involved, it, it's a whole patchwork of providers that you see together doing this. And it's often the only care that women get in the year. So those are the services and the next, uh, it's much more than family planning, but next slide starts to tell you why these services are so important. Um, and contraception in particular is, uh, you know, our goal is to make sure that all Texas women have access to preventive care that includes contraception if they want contraception. Um, and this is why contraception is mentioned specifically in our, in our mission, because it means healthier babies. Planned pregnancies are healthier than unplanned pregnancies. And unplanned pregnancies are very common in the United States, very common in Texas. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about how common. But here's, here's the, the big news is that you have, with better birth spacing, you have a much lower uh, risk of low birth weight, two-thirds less, and that means children are less likely to have uh, a whole range of issues uh, in terms of their health. So that's a really, really big one. Uh, and if you look at the concerns of health plans and the costs, Medicaid costs, this is really a big one. Uh, when kids are born too small, born too soon, that's when the, um, that's when the costs really soar. And of course, it's really hard on the babies and the families too. Um, Preterm birth and low birth weight, infant mortality is lower among planned children born of planned pregnancies, and that means more of them will make it to their first birthday. There's fewer congenital abnormalities because uh, diabetes can get under control, because uh, exposure to toxins can be uh, uh, addressed before someone gets pregnant, less exposure to tobacco, alcohol, and other drugs. And those uh, women who have a planned pregnancy are much more likely to breastfeed, which has a whole bunch of, sorry, a whole bunch of things that help children be healthy as they grow. Uh, healthier mothers is also an outcome with access to contraception. Uh, less postpartum depression uh, after a planned pregnancy than after an unplanned pregnancy, and half that incidence. Women who have planned pregnancies are more likely to be physically active. They're less likely to be overweight or obese. And uh, they're more likely to take their vitamins, their folic acid, and uh, more likely to have much less stress, which is uh, really important in terms of uh, family dynamics and so forth. If we look at the other services, the screening and treatment of other things besides the contraception issues, uh, you see that there's a big effect on women's health there as well. Early detection of diabetes, high blood pressure, the other problems that we talked about can make a huge difference. Um, the breast and cervical cancers in particular, very important to catch early, be able to treat them when a cure is more likely. Um, there's better birth spacing with the regular checkups and entry into health care is really important for women to have uh, a medical home, just like for everybody to have a medical home where if you have a problem, you know where to start. Next, please. Um, planned pregnancies also have uh, a big effect on children in general from a social and economic standpoint. Children just fare better, uh, less likely to live in poverty, 
and they're going to have fewer behavioral problems if they come from a <coughs> planned pregnancy than an unplanned pregnancy. The parent-child relationships are better. There's a lower incidence of this distant relationship with both moms and dads. Um, and there's a higher chance of, uh, for a planned child to be, um, to be living in a two-parent household, for the parents to be married, and for those parents to stay together. So those are all things that help children grow up uh, with the kind of support and resources they need to really thrive. Planning pregnancy also has benefits for uh, family well being, for the parents of, in the family well being department. Uh, less relationship conflict. How many of you have ever had relationship conflict? <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> okay, so you're going to give the talk on how to avoid relationship stress, right? Avoid relationships. How to avoid <laughs> relationships we have over here. Okay. But this is really an important piece of the puzzle in terms of forming stable relationships. And what we see so many times with unmarried 20-somethings is that they have an accidental pregnancy and then they have this crisis that may or may not mean that the couple tries to stay together. But having that relationship worked out beforehand is much healthier, it's much more successful in terms of economic outcomes. So planning is important with that. Um, they're less likely to have depression and postpartum depression. There's greater attachment to their children, and that feels good. I can tell you from firsthand. Um, the child development is uh, going to be more um, positive, fewer problems, and uh, the relationships overall going to be better between parents and kids. So all that health and social stuff is good, better among planned pregnancies than unplanned pregnancies. And what do we mean by an uh, unplanned pregnancy? Anybody? Okay. Who decides if it's planned or unplanned? The woman. The woman. The woman, right. Not me, but the woman herself classifies that pregnancy as was she trying to get pregnant at that time or not. Uh, sometimes it's just mistimed, other times it's totally unwanted, like she never wanted to get pregnant, and those are the ones that are particularly high risk. But the other reason, especially to talk to legislative folks, is about the costs of unplanned pregnancy. Because um, among the Medicaid population, the nearly 60% of our, well, 55, 54% of our births statewide are Medicaid births, right? So the state and the federal government pay for that in, uh, together. Um, and that's a lot of births. And it turns out that 57%, almost six in 10 of the births are results of unplanned pregnancies. So, and some of those, most of those are gonna turn out very well and the babies will be cherished and wanted and loved when they arrived. But their risks, as we've seen, are going to be much higher for the baby and for the mom, more often need the NICU and so forth. So this costs the state an incredible amount of money. Texas is second only to California because of California's high number of people to the cost of unplanned pregnancy and delivery. And it's over $1.34 billion a year. That's huge. Those are pregnancies that um, have high risks and high costs for the state. Now once people are um, in the system and are delivering and caring for their children, we want to support them. We don't want to put them off in a corner because a pregnancy is unplanned. It doesn't work that way. It's generally a very positive experience to have even an unplanned child. On the other hand, those unplanned children are at much higher risk. So next, part of what we're here to say is that the dollars spent on contraception and providing that contraceptive care that's a basis of this preventive care, the reason why women come in many times, as a matter of fact, is that you get a huge return on investment. For every dollar spent on uh, contraception and contraceptive care, 
the return is near six dollars. So six for one is pretty good. There's a new study that says a little bit over seven dollars. But I have to look at that a little closer before I put that in the slide. It's at least about six dollars. So that's really good. Okay, so what is the we have a, a, an issue that is important, that uh, unplanned pregnancy makes a difference in terms of money, in terms of health, and social issues. Uh, and come to find out, it's really common, okay? So it's important and it's common. 52% of our, um, our pregnancies in Texas are unplanned, 52%. Nationwide, it's only 51%, something like that. Um, that amounts to over 300,000 pregnancies every year. And that number, that 300,000 is several years old, so it's probably higher now. The other thing about unplanned pregnancy is that it's a, what we call a health disparity. So a health disparity is when you have uh, a health issue that is different for one group of people than it is for another group of people. And most commonly you're talking about minorities or people who are at, at low income poverty levels. And that's exactly what we see with the issue of unplanned pregnancy. It's much more common and increasing actually among women who are low income. On this slide you can see that the, the poorer <coughs> women as you go over time, have increasing percentages of unplanned births, unplanned pregnancies, where the more affluent women with access who have insurance and have access to the newer forms of contraception, which are so effective, their, their rates are going down. Um, we have someone asking, why was there a dip in 1994? Any thoughts about that? What was going on in 1994? Welfare reform. Uh, 97 is when welfare reform went into effect. It was signed in 96 and went into effect in 97. I don't know. <laughs> Interesting. But we want to go that direction again. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so it's important and it's common and it turns out it's really preventable. Close to 100% preventable, as a matter of fact. Um, and we now have a couple of uh, studies that show us that access to the long-acting reversible contraceptives, the higher effective, <coughs> high, more effective contraceptives can really have an effect on that rate of unplanned pregnancy as well as the rate of abortion, can really lower it. The Contraceptive Choice Project in St. Louis um, has shown us that if you get rid of the information barriers, like women know about it, they know that it's an option for them, they know they get to ask questions and it's an, uh, they are able to learn about it. And if you get rid of the cost barrier, that it doesn't cost them anything, the $1,000 or a little bit less that it often costs someone uh, to uh, pay for the initial device, the IUD or the implant. If you get rid of the, the cost the, to the patient, then many more women will choose these. So we have some, uh, it was about 10,000 women, over 9,000 women participated in the study, and three out of four of the women chose a long-acting reversible contraceptive with those barriers removed. So, and it dramatically reduced unplanned pregnancy and abortion. Okay. So we have a handout about LARCs, the long-acting reversible contraception. So our shorthand is to do this, this is, no, a bird. Um, and for women themselves, that long-acting reversible contraception doesn't make that much sense. It doesn't really sing, you know. What really seems to communicate well to women is that these are low-maintenance options. 
In other words, this is where the default is you don't get pregnant rather than the default, like if you don't, take, if you don't do something, that you will get pregnant. It really changes that up. So it's low maintenance and um, it really um, lasts for several years. Um, some of them are um, three years with um, the implant is three years, Nexplanon. And then there's a, a new uh, Skyla, which is a medicated levonorgestrel IUD that lasts three years. It's a little smaller than the Mirena. Mirena is the most popular, and that's the one that has levonorgestrel and lasts for five years. And then the Paragard, which has copper, lasts for, well, it's, it's labeled for 10 years, but we have uh, good data that allow us to recommend 12 years or even longer. So, uh, and these are things that are as effective as having your tubes tied or having his tubes tied. <laughs> okay. Which is actually, that's actually the most effective thing on the chart. So <laughs> think about it. <coughs> but that's not, that's not part of our advocacy. That's just <laughs> a side note. I noticed that the men in the room are not laughing. And so <laughs> Um, no, I, I think it takes, I think it takes um, uh, um, you know, a couple working together to, f to understand their best options, and many times uh, a vasectomy is one that, that men want. Uh, and in Texas, I think we could do a lot to make vasectomy more uh, available for those men who want it as well. Did you have a question? Cost? Uh, the, the cost of the different um, large Okay. We will. These cost a little bit more than birth control pills, but they have one twentieth the failure rate. So birth control pills have 20 times the failure rate of these methods. So the effectiveness and then the cost effectiveness over time, if you're looking at 12 years, then that means the cost is spread out over that time. So it depends how how you look at it, but there's an initial cost for the device itself uh, to be paid for, and that is something that, um, that needs to be addressed in whatever program that you have. So paying for that device, uh, up to $1,000. Okay, next. Okay, so how do LARCs work? We have a handout on LARCs. It's the one with the four squares on it. And um, this is sometimes controversial, especially with the Hobby Lobby uh, decision being in the news. A lot of people have focused on this lately, um, at least on the IUD. But here's what we know from science, is that the long-acting reversible contraceptives work primarily through inhibiting the fertilization, from preventing fertilization of the egg by the sperm before it happens. Okay, the implant Nexplanon that goes in the arm down here is uh, works by um, keeping le by preventing the egg from uh, preventing the ovary from releasing the egg. Okay, so it's very um, reliable in that sense. That's why it has such a low failure rate. It also has other effects, but its effectiveness is is agreed upon by experts to be from um, restricting that ovulation. IUDs, we have two kinds of IUDs, the one with copper and the one with levonorgestrel, which is a, a progesterone-like medication. And the progesterone, the medicated ones, uh, they work by, we believe, pri primarily by preventing fertilization by affecting sperm. Now, I think the common thought about uh, sperm is that they are able to go and swim and um, find what they need to find and fertilize what they need to fertilize, and um, we often don't realize how much the women's reproductive tract makes a difference for the function of sperm. They have to be capacitated in glands in the cervix. They need to be able to swim properly and function properly after that to get through the uterus and up into the tubes. 
And all of that is changed by both of these types of IUDs, by the copper and by the uh, morena and skyla, the levonorgestrel. We know that these IUDs could also interfere with implantation. So for some people, that's kind of a deal breaker. If it might, if it might work after the joining of the sperm and the egg, that might be a deal breaker for them. But for most women and most people, the low chance that that's actually happening is something that they're comfortable with. Okay. Questions about the mechanism of action? Comments about the mechani mechanism of action? Do we need more dessert to uh, <laughs> think about that? So how many of you uh, consider the, how IUDs work to be controversial for yourselves, for your, in your world? Oh, that's not a fair question. <laughs> okay, so the people who laughed thought it might be controversial, okay. But some people do. I think it depends on your point of view. From a, a medical perspective, I'm very comfortable that almost all the time these work to prevent fertilization. I can't prove that it never ever works after fertilization, but I'm comfortable that it usually works almost always before. Somebody was going to ask, yes? medical long-term effects of a woman not dropping an egg every month or not having her cervix replenished, the lining, like that's always been okay. my question about large. Excellent question. If a woman doesn't have cycles, is that bad? Uh, if a woman doesn't release an egg every month, is that bad? That's what happens when you're on birth control. Does it crowd? Not that we know of. Not that we know of. It's important to put it in perspective that uh, women, before we had any manipulation of the cycle, uh, usually didn't have monthly bleeding. Usually they were either breastfeeding or pregnant. And so there wasn't that much uh, ovarian turnover as we have in the modern world. Um, and uh, with birth control pills, we've had a lot of study that shows that uh, that not bleeding, uh, not ovulating for long periods of time is not dangerous. In fact, it protects you from two kinds of cancer. Anybody know? Ovarian cancer protects women from ovarian cancer and it protects women from uh, endometrial cancer. So that's birth control pills. Okay, not these. Yes? Okay, so the question is, it, it right. So if you're not having the usual cycle hormone changes, what about those effects? And those again have been studied, uh, especially with birth control pills, but with all these methods, women are being studied over long periods of time and these are exceedingly safe. Next, please. Okay. So this is a graph, uh, a, a graphic to help you see uh, the comparison of the pregnancy rate for women who use birth control pills or patches or rings, which are the, um, the green bars, versus the women using the long-acting reversible contraceptives in this big 10,000 women study. And you can see that there's a big difference between LARCs and the shot and um, birth control pills. And this was the really dramatic thing to see how it worked in practice when you got rid of the barriers. And this has now really opened up the field to really make much more progress from that slide that we saw from 1994 and, all, and then going up. So this is where the excitement is in the field to be able to um, make these available and make a lot of progress. So we have a, a history in this country of forced and uninformed sterilizations of poor women, primarily of color. I think I saw something just recently. They're still doing it somewhere. Um, has somebody been running the traps on some 
some of this stuff with the civil rights organizations to make sure that they're on board with it, particularly getting Medicaid reimbursement for the for the large of them, um, getting to the models going to the hospital. So they're going to be disproportionately more involved. Thank you for your question. He's asking about the history of um, forced sterilization, many times of minority and poor women uh, in the past. Part of these programs that is so important is the voluntary nature of it. Um, the, uh, the whole idea is not to be convincing women to use anything, but rather making things available for what they would like to have. Um, and that's super important. I'd be interested in talking with you about who you think we should talk to about this uh, because we want that to be very clear. We're not pushing contraception, we're pushing access. Yeah, and I get where you guys are coming from. I understand that. There are going to be some people who don't, and this is awfully close to that really ugly thing. So uh, I think that's pretty Thanks for your comment. Um, to that. My, my name is Alan. I work at the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health. And um, the Latina women that we've worked with in the Rio Grande Valley um, that we've surveyed and, and who would be disproportionately affected by some of the historical policies you're referencing actually prefer this form of contraception. And the Texas Policy Evaluation Project actually has some good data on that, and it's available on their website. Um, I think it's a good question because there is a history there, but I can tell you from my experience and the data that I've that I'm familiar with that Latinas in Texas overwhelmingly prefer this. So is your organization gonna be getting a little I just think maybe have some grass tops kind of saying, look, this is a good thing for the women that we represent. This is not that other thing. It's okay. And yeah, I think it comes down to what Dr. Riolini just mentioned. When we get nervous when people don't emphasize the voluntary nature of this and how um, different birth control is, is, should be available to all women, the option. So when we hear it framed in terms of options and choice and voluntary, we're comfortable and we'll say so. Right. Thank you so much for that question and for the response on um, it. But I think this slide shows you that uh, for women who are going, uh, asking an, in a clinical setting for birth control of some sort, for contraception, access to these more effective ones uh, is very important for, uh, for women um, poor or rich. Next, please. Um, so uh, just to summarize, the evidence is strong, they're highly effective and safe, and they're safe for most women. You don't have to have had a child already, uh, for example. And the American College of OBGYNs has really uh, laid that out, that these are, should be uh, available for more women. Next, please. So let's talk a little bit about the state programs and uh, what's going on with those. Uh, we have two programs that provide these services, that fund these services uh, in the Department of State Health Services, which is the agency, you can think of that as the public health agency. Uh, and we have one program that's housed uh, at the uh, HHSC, which is really the Medicaid agency. You could simplify thinking of uh, those. There's a lot more complexity, but um, it helps us think about that. And these agencies now are being proposed by the Sunset staff to be consolidated all into one agency. So we have these three funding streams, family planning, that's the stream that got cut so much in 2011, uh, expanded primary health care program, which uh, is about 60% family planning and 40% other kinds of services for women, uh, and then the Texas Women's Health Program, which began in 2013. Uh, after the, the federal funding piece of it was um, excluded. Okay, next. And uh, the sunset process, which I assume you all are uh, at least a little bit familiar with at this point, since that's what's going on right now with the recent hearing. Um, uh, the staff recommendation was to consolidate these three funding streams. And uh, on the next slide, you see a little comparison of what each of these, the Texas Women's Health Program, Family Planning Program, Expanded Primary Health Care, and then what the sunset proposal uh, is to kind of compare and contrast. And um, 
you can see that um, the the pro the plan proposed the the program proposed would be a simplified program. It would be fee for service only, kind of like the Texas Women's Health Program is right now. There are certain things it'll pay for, and you do the service and you get paid. That's what fee for service is. It would cover uh, women up to 185 percent of the federal poverty level. Uh, women ages 15 to 44, uh, and they would need to be Texas residents. Um, and then in addition to the services that we listed that are um, available through all these different programs, the basic family planning and screening program, uh, it would, if you come in as a family planning patient, would be covering a good deal of diagnosis and treatment uh, of the conditions that might be found at that time. Uh, there's also a provision for mammograms, treatment of any cervical dysplasia, and some case management as well. So this is the combination that was proposed. We recently uh, testified at the hearing, and our testimony is available as a handout in the back, uh, that we, um, we have some concerns. We're not opposed to uh, consolidation per se, but the plan as proposed needs uh, some adjustment if it's going to be successful uh, and not lose providers, not put providers out of this business, and um, uh, not reduce access for patients on that basis. So uh, the couple of, they're kind of technical, but um, if you have only fee-for-service, then a lot of these providers don't have other funding to keep their doors open while they're waiting for that fee to come, that fee payment to come in. In other words, they couldn't go ahead and treat the patient. Um, they wouldn't know if she was eligible and they would be at their own financial risk. So they need some form of grant or cost reimbursement as the, the DSHS programs do now, um, up to 50%, some of the providers say. Um, so that they can keep their doors open, so they can continue to help with the eligibility process, and so they don't have to tell women, okay, go on the internet and get your form filled out, and when you get your card, come back, which often may be six weeks, something like that, and they may come back pregnant when they wanted to avoid that pregnancy. They may come back sick with uh, something that they had that could have been treated earlier. So that cost reimbursement is needed for many, many of the safety net providers. Uh, we're also concerned about that presumptive eligibility, being able to take care of someone with a good faith effort to determine their eligibility and the staff time that you put into that uh, so that you're not at financial risk as a, as a provider. We want meaningful provider input into the process uh, and a, perhaps a an ad hoc uh, a committee that's temporary that would not continue after the process was completed. But the providers need to be able to tell the decision makers what the consequences, the unintended consequences of their plan and how it's working would be. So that's something we feel is important. Um, we would like to see a broader range of women served, up to 250 percent of the federal poverty level as with the family planning program. Um, that there would be no age restriction. For example, uh, someone who's 45 and still needs birth control could get, get services through this plan. Uh, and we'd like to have men still have access. About 10% of the patients, or 5 to 10%, depending on the clinic, um, are, who are seen in family planning are men. And that includes uh, STD checks and condoms and vasectomies. So we'd like to include that. I don't know what we'll do about our name was the Texas Women's Healthcare Coalition and some men too. <laughs> yes. I I 
So the question is about the uh, response to the comments that were made at the Sunset staff. Uh, the, the staff responded that men would have access to the primary health care program, um, and that's how they could get taken care of. Um, I think uh, it's uh, best viewed as, well, men have access to that now. And it's not the expanded primary health care program we're talking about here. It's the original primary health care program, which is pretty small and doesn't reach very far. Um, and so that's why so many men have taken advantage of the family planning program through clinics that have been in tune to helping women, women's partners, and men in the community who would like to um, address their sexual health and their childbearing. Uh, so it's just not very... Yes, it's there, but it doesn't, it's, it's there now, and it's still needed now. Um, so we'd like to serve more patients. We'd also like to maximize that benefit package. And a lot of our members are fairly qualified health centers, for example, and uh, physicians who see a broad array, array of things um, besides just family planning. And so we'd like to have as much coverage as possible. Um, I think that there's lots of different ways that Texas could consider what to do about how to maximize the federal contribution to um, health care in Texas, especially for low-income people and poor people. Um, but uh, I think we also have to recognize that the more other services that we add besides family planning, we're going to have to, if we don't want to reduce the number of family planning patients, we have to increase the amount. So we've made a rough calculation that if the model were an EPHC model, expanded primary health care model, instead of a Texas Women's Health Care, uh, Texas Women's Health Program model, everybody following me? If it was an EPHC model, that we'd need instead of 107.6 million a year, we need about 145 million a year to do that without reducing the number of women in family planning. And that's just a rough calculation. We're still missing some data with which to make an accurate calculation on that. So we want to maximize the benefits package. Let's do as much as we can uh, and um, for as many people as we can. And uh, we really are interested in that last recommendation that wasn't for legislation, but rather to study uh, that uh, postpartum auto enrollment. And we really have have been asking for that for a long time. So we'd like to see that expedited in whatever way is possible. As you can tell from our little trifold, um, which Anne is holding up here, there's one for you here. Our overall goals as a coalition are not just about the sunset. We're talking about the details of how our goals intersect with what the sunset has recommended. But uh, we really want to increase funding for women's preventive health care. We'd like everybody to have health care, of course, but for this particular issue, we want to increase funding. Uh, we want to make sure that if there is consolidation, that we're maximizing access and minimizing disruption. These are provider networks that have been recently uh, in a great deal of turmoil, once, twice, and now the third time may be the charm uh, and, and kill some of them. So we want to make sure that we're taking care of their needs. Um, and we want to increase provider capacity with reaching out to more providers, making providers more effective, and making sure that LARCs are accessible both to the providers and to the patients that they're taking care of, getting rid of the information barriers and the cost barriers. Yes? So the, the question is, what is the coalition's position on access to postpartum mental health care? Um, we haven't taken an official position on that. We certainly would want to see those women in, um, in care that is able to detect those problems, but we haven't taken a position on how to take care of those problems once, once detected. Other questions? Yes. Um, do all of the women's uh, healthcare programs, expanded primary healthcare, programs, do they all cover LARCs and their removal? Do they all cover LARCs? Do they all cover LARCs and their removal? So the question is whether all three of the programs currently cover LARCs and their removal, and uh, yes, they do. Yeah. 
Yes, they do. I think that they're, the DSHS and T, uh, HHSC are already doing some things to remove barriers to those larks. And that's why you'll see the cost per, per woman per year has increased a little bit. So it's a short-term increase in the cost per woman because they're doing more larks. Uh, we don't really have the data on how much, but um, we have a little bit, um, but not as recently as we'd like to see. So there is a big push. I think um, uh, Commissioner Janik is very much in support of access to LARCs. And again, nothing being pushed or required, but rather just to reduce the barriers so women can access the kind of care that they really would like to have. Well, I just want to say thank you again uh, for, to all of you for coming. Thank you to Representative Howard uh, and to all of your bosses for, um, for what they do. I know it's not an easy job. Thank you to Anna Chatillon. I want her to stand up so you can meet her. She's our staff at the coalition, and uh, she will be uh, the person that you have uh, to contact day and night during the session to ask any question uh, and make any progress that we can. Thank you so much. Be sure and eat some of those le little lemon squares for dessert because they rock. <laughs> Thank you.